Hello and welcome to the Teutonic Knights, a podcast by the History of the Germans, episode 5, The Battle on the Ice. Now first up, a happy new year to all of you. 2023 was a great time here on the History of the Germans, and I learned an awful lot about the colonization of the East, about the Hanse, and about the Teutonic Knights. And I hope you enjoyed coming along for the journey. Now the plan for 2024 is to, well, obviously complete the Teutonic Knights, and then revert to the broad chronological story, i.e. resume where we left off last January with the death of Emperor Frederick II. We will go through the Interregnum, King Rudolf of Habsburg, and then spend some time with one of the most glamorous and, outside Czechia, sadly largely forgotten emperors, the Luxembourgers, Henry VII, the blind King John of Bohemia, Charles IV, and Sigismund, to name just a few. I have given up making predictions about how long that will take, given how wrong I usually am. But one prediction I can make, though, is that this week we will look at the activities of the Teutonic Order in Livonia during the 13th century. And the situation in Livonia was profoundly different to Prussia and posed a number of new challenges for the brothers. In Livonia, there were the powerful bishops of Riga to contend with who had led the crusade there since its inception in the 1180s. The Hanse merchants who have settled in Riga, Rival and Dorpat were no pushovers either. And like in Prussia, the Lithuanians are a formidable force able to inflict painful defeats on the brothers, as are some of the Baltic peoples who didn't enjoy conversion at sword point as much as the planners back in Bremen, Marburg and Acre had hoped. And let's not forget some new neighbours, the Danes in northern Estonia and the great Republic of Novgorod. In 1240, a great effort gets underway to forcibly convert the Orthodox Russian states, including Novgorod, that are already under pressure from the Mongols. In their distress, the boyars of Novgorod make the second son of the Grand Duke of Vladimir their military leader, a man we know as Alexander Nevsky. And on April 5, 1242, Alexander Nevsky and his men stand on the shore of Lake Papus staring at heavily armoured cavalry thundering across the ice towards them. Whilst the riders almost certainly weren't accompanied by Prokofiev's amazing soundtrack, they may have brought an organ. But that, like everything else about the battle on the ice, is subject to intense debate, a debate we will examine in this episode. But before we start, just a reminder. The History of the Germans podcast is advertising free thanks to the generous support from Patreon, and you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com slash support. you find all the links in the show notes and thanks a lot to Adrian V, Brett Wayne C, Fernando M and Austin H who've already signed up. So, back to the show. We start with Livonia. Now, Livonia is the name the Teutonic Knights used for what is roughly modern-day Latvia and Estonia. And it was a misnomer already at that time, since Livonia meant the land of the Livs, one of the various peoples that lived in the area, but by no means the only one, nor even the dominant one. And whilst the Prussians were all Baltic peoples, Speaking a language related to modern-day Latvian and Lithuanian, the inhabitants of Livonia were divided. Into Baltic peoples, the Semigallians and Coronians, to name the largest groups, and the Finnic peoples, the Estonians and Livonians, who spoke an Uralic language related to Finnish. But that is not the only difference between Livonia and Prussia. We did cover the Crusades into Livonia up until the arrival of the Teutonic Knights in some detail in episode 110 the Livonian cities, so I will limit myself to a very brief outline here. First up, the conquest had been led by the bishops and then later archbishops of Riga, not by a chivalric order. The man at the centre of this crusade was Albrecht von Buxhoved, who held the bishopric for 30 years from 1199 to 1229. And I made a terrible mistake in episode 110 when I called him Albrecht von Buxtehude, following the lead in one of the secondary sources, which I didn't double-check. 
very much my bad, and thanks to listener Ulrike C. who pointed this out to me. Albrecht from Buxhövet was an excellent organizer, networker and war leader, relentlessly traveling between his new capital in Riga and northern Germany, where he was drumming up support. Apparently, he did the trip 27 times. His great skill lay in recruiting wave upon wave of crusaders to come to the frozen north, convert the local pagans, and then consolidating these gains during the cold winters when ice cut his new diocese off from supplies. Like Conrad of Mazovia would a few decades later, Albrecht realized quite quickly that the second part of that equation was a lot trickier than the first. Lots of men were keen to come on crusade during the years following the death of Emperor Henry VI in 1197. If you remember, the empire fell into a civil war between the Hohenstaufen and the wealth that lasted for more than a decade. Many imperial noblemen were unsure which side to support. A simple way to avoid that question was to go on crusade. Crusading vows superseded all loyalty as a vassal. And even more important was that a crusader's land was protected from any attack during his absence. Throw in the absolution for the crimes and violence already committed and going on crusade was an attractive option for many an imperial knight and prince. Livonia was a more attractive destination to crusade in as it was cheaper and less dangerous than the Near East, where they may encounter well-armed and well-trained adversaries, and not to mention all the diseases and the foreign food. The problem with the Crusaders for Albrecht was that they tended to return home as soon as their promised time on Crusade was up. So to create a more stable military presence in Livonia, Bishop Albrecht pursued three strategies in parallel. The first one was to create his own local force by handing out fiefs to knights who were prepared to stay for good. The second was to establish his own chivalric order, the Livonian Brothers of the Sword. And then he had a civil leg to his strategy too. He founded the city of Riga in 1201 and gave the Hansa merchants who settled there the city laws of Hamburg. What he did not do, for reasons that I am not sure about, was to bring in settlers to colonize the open countryside. As a consequence of this, Livonia had multiple centers of power. The bishop was at least initially the most important center. He owned two-thirds of the land. Then there was the city of Riga that had its own rights and, thanks to the trade along the Dogova River, became very rich and very powerful very quickly. The vassals the bishop had given the fiefs to were broadly loyal, but like everywhere in medieval Europe, were necessarily always obedient. And there were the Livonian Sword Brothers, the chivalric order that Albrecht of Bornhoved had founded. What was great about them was that they were very efficient and ruthless fighters. They built a string of fortresses along the Dogova from where they could protect the trade along the river against incursions from the semi gallians who lived on the southern shore. They also conquered territory from the Livonians and Estonians on the northern shore of the Dogova, as well as expanded further east in the direction of Dorpat, modern-day Tartu, getting ever closer to Novgorod. There, too, they erected many new castles, initially in wood and as time went by in brick. So, so far, so good. But problems arose, because building castles and fighting the semi gallions was expensive. The Sword Brothers needed money. Lots of money. The other chivalric orders, like the Teutonic Knights, could rely on their network of contours, of estates and convents back home in Western Europe, sending them money to cover these costs. The Livonian Sword Brothers had very few estates back home in the Empire. I have not found a clear description of why that was the case. But part of it may have to do with their attachment to the Bishop of Riga. If you remember the way, for instance, the Teutonic Knights convinced donors to support them was by giving them indulgences in return. Indulgences, just to remind you, were sort of get-out-of-jail-free cards that a sinner could use to wipe out whatever misbehavior would block their entry into paradise. The theological argument behind indulgences was that all the saints, apostles, and Jesus himself 
had built up divine grace far in excess of what they needed to get into heaven themselves, and that excess divine grace was left back on earth for the church to grant to sinners in exchange for any good works. And good works could be going on crusade, paying someone else to go on crusade in one stead, or just simply giving money or land to the church. Now, here's the rub for the Livonian Sword Brothers. The person put on earth to administer this treasure of excess divine grace was the Pope, and the Pope had shared some of it with his bishops and the religious orders, including the chivalric orders, which is why, for instance, the Teutonic Order could fund itself by issuing indulgences. Now, an order like the Livonian Sword Brothers, who reported not to the Pope, but to the Bishop of Riga, had only access to the limited excess divine grace that the Bishop of Riga had at his disposal. And given the so far modest number of martyrs and mystics in Livonia, there wasn't much indulgence to go around. Donors hence preferred to pass their wealth on to the Templars, the Knights of St. John or the Teutonic Order, who had a bigger store of this valuable commodity. That left the Sword Brothers with a limited set of options. Option 1 was the most prosaic one, trying to improve their financial position by exploiting and gathering more assets in Livonia itself. Option 2 was to try to get out from under the control of the bishop and gain direct recognition by the Pope and with that, access to his store of divine grace and the indulgences. Option 3 was to build up their own store of divine grace by performing great feats of martyrdom, something they did a lot of, but it had the downside of reducing the already moderate number of sword brothers. And finally, as a very last resort, there was option 4, joining an existing chivalric order, specifically the Teutonic Knights. Now, the Livonian Sword Brothers tried all four options in parallel, which ended up making their position even worse. So they kicked off with option 1 and squeezed their peasants harder and harder, which led to a revolt in 1222, which was costly to put down. Then they pressured the bishop to grant them more of the spoils of war. So far, the split was two thirds of all newly conquered land went to the bishop and one third to the Sword Brothers. They managed to flip that formula in their favor. But that was still not enough. So they came up with an audacious plan. North of Livonia, another great crusader, King Valdemar of Denmark, had mounted an attack against the Estonians. That had not only provided him with the Dannebrog, the iconic Danish flag that had appeared from the heavens during a crucial battle, but also his own crusader state. And that colony and its major cities, namely Rival, modern day Tallinn, and Nava were thriving, which made the Lithuanian brothers believe that it would be the solution to all their problems. So when King Valdemar was otherwise engaged, check episode 111 for details, the Sword Brothers took over Estonia. Far from being the solution to their problems, it became the source of all their woes. Their boss, Bishop Albrecht, had made a deal with Valdemar, delineating their respective spheres of influence. The attack on the Sword Brothers, who were nominally his men, was a major embarrassment for Albrecht and threatened his position back home in Germany. The Pope also did not like the idea of two Christian parties on crusade at war with each other. So, the papal legate forced the Sword Brothers to give northern Estonia back to the Danes. Their master agreed and withdrew, at which point the other members of the order rebelled and elected a new one who instantly returned them to Estonia. Now the papal legate is seriously angry and proposes to the Pope to suppress the Livonian Sword Brothers. Ouch. So, option 1 has not yielded much benefit and option 2, becoming an order recognized directly by the Pope, is now off the list. That leaves just two, dying a good martyr's death or joining the Teutonic Knights. In the interest of self-preservation, in 1231, Master Folkwin of the Sword Brothers proposed a merger with the Teutonic Knights. Hermann von Salza sent two knights to inspect the situation in Livonia. Their advice was unambiguous. No way should we associate with this rabble. They are completely lacking in discipline and are a rough and ready lot. This verdict has been copied over and over by historians and is taken as gospel. 
and I think it is likely that the Livonian sword brothers, poor and desperate as they were, had to admit people with, let's say, less than perfect table manners. But my money is on the emissaries getting a good sense of the complexities of Livonia in deciding that at that point, with the Prussian conquest just starting, it was simply a bridge too far. So for our Livonian sword brothers, things are pretty wretched by 1236. They are still short of money and the Pope's legate is going on and on about returning Estonia to the Danes and suppressing them. To add to their irritation, some Holstein knights show up late for the annual crusading season and still demand some action and presto. We are now in that transition period where the northern crusades go from a serious military operation to some sort of medieval adventure holiday. Crusaders who come down to Livonia expect to do a sufficient amount of fighting so that they can tell their friends and family back home that they have done their bit to spread the glad tidings. So late in the season there is no real strategic target that could be pursued, so the Livonian brothers decided to take their guests on a short raiding and plundering jolly to Semigallia, the area south of the Dogava that separates Livonia from Lithuania. This was a wilderness one entered at once peril. As they were hacking their way through the undergrowth, Master Folkwin of the Sword Brothers realized that they were in a bit of a pickle. A Semigallian force had appeared and was blocking a ford across the river Sol. The Master ordered the knights to dismount and fight their way across on foot. Time was of the essence since pagan reinforcements might arrive during the night making the crossing almost impossible. The Holstein guests, however, refused to get off their horses as that would be shameful for a proud knight. The Sword Brothers were too few to go it alone and so the Crusaders made camp for the night. Next morning, guess who appears alongside the semi galleons Yes, it is Mindogas, the great leader of the Lithuanians, with a large army. The proud Holstein knights now mount their horses only to experience an unscheduled dismounting, courtesy of the Lithuanians, followed by heroic knightly death in the mud of the river Sol. As do the master of the sword brothers and almost half of the total force of that order. Now, they may have enough martyrs to issue indulgences, but militarily they are finished. They send two knights to Pope Honorius III to beg for help, Honorius tells them to kneel, releases them from their vows as Livonian sword brothers, make them to swear the oath of the Teutonic Knights, give them the iconic white mantle with a black cross, and with that the Livonian sword brothers no longer exist, but are subsumed into the Teutonic Knights. Hermann von Salza now sends his best man, Hermann Balk, the man who had masterminded the first leg of the conquest of Prussia, to Livonia to sort it all out. Balk arrives with 60 Teutonic Knight brothers and their retinue, enough to garrison the main castles. He withdraws the Sword Brothers from northern Estonia and hands it back to the Danes. Money comes into Livonia from the vast holdings of the Teutonic Knights in the west. New garrisons can keep the Semigallians and the Lithuanians in check, and Hermann Balk starts reorganizing the Livonian Sword Brothers. Unsurprisingly, many of the Livonian Sword Brothers are upset about the takeover, the loss of independence and the abandonment of Estonia. Balk sends the most vocal ones to Palestine, where some of them defect to the Templars. The rest are split up and posted to remote castles well out of the way. Hermann Balk retired in 1238 and passes the baton as Livonian master on to Dietrich von Gruningen. So, all good now? Well, not really. The resentment of the remaining sword brothers keeps rumbling below the surface. And another, much broader conflict is about to engulf the fragile Livonian colony. And that had to do with Constantinople. In 1204, the Fourth Crusade had conquered Constantinople and had replaced the Orthodox Emperor with a Catholic one. In the mind of the popes, we are now halfway to the reunification of the two great Christian churches the Catholics in the West and the Orthodox in the East, under the Bishop of Rome. Now, Orthodox Christianity had expanded from Constantinople north and eastwards and had been adopted by, amongst others, the Empire of the Kievan Rus, 
That empire had broken apart into a number of small principalities, which by 1239 had been largely overrun by the Mongols. So as far as the papacy was concerned, this was certainly a sad thing for the Russians, but also a great opportunity. The Catholic Church offered the various remaining princes support against their Mongol overlords in exchange for conversion from Orthodoxy to Rome. Some took it like Daniel of Galicia, who ruled over what is today Western Ukraine. The largest and the most attractive of the successor states of the Kievan Rus was Novgorod. If a conversion could be effected there, the political power of the Orthodox faith would be reduced to just some vassals of the Mongols and the Byzantine rebel states that had emerged in the wake of the sack of Constantinople in 1204. The idea of making Novgorod part of Western Christianity did resonate well with some of the expansionist powers along the Baltic. After all, the great trading center of Novgorod was probably the richest city between Lübeck and the North Pole. The Swedes were particularly ambitious. They marched down the Finnish coast and blocked the mouth of the Neva River. Listeners to the Hanseatic League season will know that the Neva, where modern-day St. Petersburg stands now, was at the time the entry point for Baltic merchants going to Novgorod. Closing this vital artery cut Novgorod from not only its main source of money, but also from imported salt that they needed to preserve its food for the winter. Novgorod at the time was a boyar republic, meaning that the leading families would administer the city. Most of the time the city acknowledged a feudal prince as its overlord, usually whichever Rurik prince was most powerful in the region. In 1236 the chosen prince was Alexander Iaraslavich, second son of the Grand Prince of Vladimir. This Alexander recruited an army to confront the Swedes and on July 15th defeated them on the Neva River. The Swedish force withdrew and the shipping route reopened for trade. That success was so unexpected and so complete that Alexander got two things for it. For one, he was honoured by receiving the name Nevsky, by which we still know him today, Alexander Nevsky. And he was immediately exiled from the city of Novgorod, because seriously, who wants a war hero swanning about in a boyar republic? Up until this point, all that I have said is largely consensual, though some argue the Mongols played a lesser role in the papal plans and that coordination lay with the papal legate in Livonia. Now everything I tell you from here forward is my best guess based on the various accounts I've read, which in turn is only a small section of the libraries and libraries written on the subject. And that subject, you may have guessed, is the famous Battle on the Ice, made immortal by Sergei Eisenstein's epic 1938 movie. We have two primary sources for this event, one being the Novgorod Chronicle, reflecting the perspective of the rulers of Novgorod, and the Livonian Rhymed Chronicle, written by an unnamed member of the Teutonic Order. Both have been written not long after the events described, making them both valid sources. The problem is that they do not quite match, sparking endless debates. Now here's what I think happened. Parallel to the Swedish effort in 1240 and maybe or maybe not coordinated by the papal legate William of San Sabina, another crusade set off from Livonia in the direction of Novgorod. Participants in this crusade were crusaders from Western Europe, likely the Empire and Poland, local Estonian auxiliaries, some Teutonic knights and some Danish knights, including the sons of the King of Denmark. What is unclear is whether these Teutonic knights were former Livonian sword brothers who were operating against the instruction from the Livonian master, or Teutonic knights operating under the auspices of an agreement between the order, the Danish king and the papal legate. What is not disputed is that this push was successful. The crusader army drove into Novgorod territory and got as far as within 20 miles of the city itself, raiding and plundering in the hope of reducing its food supplies. They also managed to place a friendly new government in the city of Pskov, which lies south of Novgorod. At that point, the aristocrats ruling Novgorod became more concerned about the invaders 
than about a military commander becoming an autocrat in their city, and hence recalled Alexander Nevsky. They, I am sure, apologized profusely for last year's decision to exile him, and offered him God knows what, if he would only defeat these Westerners. So in autumn 1241, Alexander Nevsky lets his troops against the forts the invaders had erected east of Nava, and drove them out. Then he moved southwards towards Pskov and took it without much difficulty. The Livonian Rhyme Chronicle said that the garrison consisted of just two brothers and their retinue, so in total maybe 30 men, making that conquest a little less heroic than it appeared. After some raiding in Livonian territory, Nevsky then led his army to Lake Papus, an inland water that still today marks the border between Estonia and Russia. It is April the 5th in the Julian calendar, the 12th in hours, still fairly cold, and the lake is still frozen. Nevsky arrives on the shore of Lake Papus with an army usually estimated at about 6,000 men, mostly professional soldiers from Novgorod. On the opposite shore, the Crusader army is gathered. They are usually estimated at about 2,000 men, led by the Bishop of Dorpat, Hermann von Boxhövet, a brother of Bishop Albrecht von Riga. They comprise roughly 1,000 Estonian auxiliaries, whilst the rest is split into Danish knights, Crusaders and Teutonic knights, at least some of them former Livonian sword brothers. The battle begins with that famous charge across the ice that is one of the most captivating moments of Sergei Eisenstein's famous movie. And as usual in medieval cavalry charges, the idea is to break the center of the enemy by fear and momentum and drive them to flight. If that fails, battle turns into hand-to-hand -hand combat until one or other side gives up exhausted. And so it happened here too. The center of Alexander Nevsky's army held, and the crusaders were forced into combat on the slippery surface of Lake Papers. The Novgorod Chronicle reports that there was a great slaughter of Germans and Estonians, after which the remains of the army fled. Nevsky's men caught up with them seven kilometers from the Estonian shore and surrounded them where, according to the Chronicle of Novgorod, fell a countless number of Estonians and 400 of the Germans. The knight's own chronicler seems to have very different numbers. He says that, quote, Then the brother's army was completely surrounded, for the Russians had had so many troops that there were easily 60 men for every German knight. The brothers fought well enough, but they were nonetheless cut down. Some of those from Dorpat escaped. Twenty brothers lay dead, and six were captured. End quote. The discrepancy between the chronicles had caused endless debate about the scale and the significance of the battle. Sure, the numbers look very far apart. Twenty brothers, according to the German chronicle, and four hundred in the Russian telling. But there is a way to reconcile those. When we talk about the Teutonic Knights' forces, each knight would usually have around ten additional fighters with them, some squires helping the knight and others acting as infantry covering the rider. So, twenty dead brothers would equate to two hundred dead men from the Teutonic Order. If you then take into account that there were also Danish knights and other crusaders on the field, that the Russians counted as Germans, an estimated loss of four hundred Germans in inverted commas seems reasonable. Now, death toll in battle is one thing, but the even bigger dispute is about the significance of the battle. In Russia, the anniversary of the Battle on the Ice is one of the 20 days of military honor commemorating major military successes. In other words, the Russians believe this event to be of a significance on par with the victory over Napoleon at Borodino in 1812 and over Nazi Germany at Stalingrad. In the Russian narrative, this was the moment that stopped the attack on the Orthodox faith and in consequence on Russian culture. Now if we assume that the attack on Novgorod was at least in part aimed at converting them to Roman Catholicism, there is a certain logic here. This is the same logic that has elevated the equally modestly sized battle at Tours in 732 to the decisive moment when Western Europe refuted the imposition of Islam. If you take the view that the papal involvement in the planning was modest, and the main aim of the effort was simply plunder, then the battle could be classed as just another border skirmish, maybe a larger than usual one, but in the end, a border skirmish. 
In either case, the battle had no further military consequences. Nevsky did not pursue the crusaders into Livonia. The two sides signed an agreement in 1243 guaranteeing the old border from before 1240, and these borders held for at least a century. And what is also true is that Sergei Eisenstein's movie explains more about Soviet views of Nazi Germany in 1938 than it does about medieval warfare. The Teutonic Knights, despite their undeniable brutality, weren't gigantic blonde proto-Nazis who burned babies, nor were the Estonians and Latvians enslaved little people, as the film suggests, or were the Russian forces pre-Lenin communist peasants. The Livonian master was not at the battle, and he was not taken prisoner. Alexander Nevsky did not stand up to the Mongols, or contraire, he became one of their loyal vassals. There is also no mention in either Russian or German sources that the heavily armoured Teutonic knights in their huge war horses broke through the ice and died a cold and miserable death. The ice there is strong enough to carry a man on horseback, and if you do not believe it, Google Lake Papers Trucks. Still, the film is a masterpiece, and Prokofiev's score underlying the attack of the Teutonic Knights is a most haunting experience. Therefore, if you watch it, you can understand that one of the conditions of the Hitler-Stalin Pact was to shelf the film. Another reason why hostilities between Livonia and Novgorod did not resume in earnest was that one of the main constituencies in Livonia was fundamentally opposed to such a venture. The merchants of Riga, Rival, Dorpat and Narva all traded extensively with Novgorod, where they maintained the Hanse contour. They transported their wares across the rivers and roads on which such a campaign would be fought. And other than in Prussia, the merchants in Livonia were powerful and independent. After the battle on the ice, the military powers in Livonia, i.e. the Bishop of Riga and the Teutonic Order, could return to the job at hand, converting the locals to Christianity. One thing that helped the Crusaders was that the different peoples in Livonia were even more disunited than the Prussians. The Knights brothers could muster fairly large forces by recruiting the arch enemies of whichever group they were attacking at any particular point, Semigallians against Coronians, Livonians against Estonians, and so forth and so forth. The flip side of these arrangements was that the peace agreement octroyed on the defeated party usually had to be quite mild. The demands were usually formal conversion, a ban on pagan customs like polygamy and the rather cruel tradition of infanticide of girls, the imposition of taxes and tithes, and other more generic legal rules. In return, they would be recognized as free men on their own land, and their leaders co-opted into the Christian aristocracy. Part of the reason this system was introduced must have to do with the fact that there was no large colonization program for the open countryside, as had been introduced in Prussia and before that in the Bozenland. Why that did not happen, I'm not sure. Maybe it was just a bit too far north, even for intrepid colonists, or the land was not sufficiently fertile to sustain another population alongside the existing peoples. The only immigration by German-speaking peoples was into the cities, and that included the cities that were under Danish control, namely Rival and Narva. This policy found its high point in 1252, when the Grand Duke of Lithuania, the Great Mindaugas, accepted Roman Catholicism and was crowned as King of Lithuania by a German bishop and in the presence of the Livonian master. That, plus a broadly favourable modus operandi with the Danish administration of Estonia, meant the province now seemed all at ease. Business was flourishing, and the Teutonic Knights could entertain their crusader guests with regular raids into some parts of Semigallia or Coronia that had not yet sufficiently embraced the new religion. And the system collapsed in 1259, when Mindaugas' patience ran out. We already talked about the Battle of Dobe last week, so I will not repeat the story. But the net effect was the same in Livonia as it had been in Prussia. Within a short period of time, the order found itself pushed back into its core positions, the main forts along the Dogava and in southern Estonia. What made things even more difficult than in Prussia was that the bishop, now Archbishop of Riga, regarded the Knight Brothers as much more threatening than the pagans. 
the bishop formed an alliance with the pagan Lithuanians against the order and hired a German adventurer, Gunzelin von Schwerin, to lead his armies. Now I will spare you the details of the process, but just imagine a repeat of what we had last week. Just worse. The net result, too, was similar. Riga fell and Gunzelin fled back home. With the help of crusaders, the open countryside north of the Dogeva was cleared of rebels. The land south of the Dogeva was turned into a buffer zone, an uninhabited wilderness. The Semigallians and Selonians, who survived the conflict, went into exile in Lithuania. The Coronians were completely defeated, and a line of forts and castles protected the core of Livonia and the trade along the Dogeva. As for northern Estonia, the Danish bit, they had a quieter time apart from an attack from Novgorod that again was probably less significant than chroniclers made it out. The province was technically part of the Danish kingdom, but the actual power of the Danish monarch extended not much beyond the walls of the big cities, Eval and Nava. And in the countryside, they left the administration to the Danes, who had now formed their own aristocracy, and the Teutonic Knights. As absentee landlords, their interest dwindled to the point that in 1365 the Danish king sold its holdings to the Teutonic Order for 10,000 marks of silver. So by the last decade of the 13th century, the Teutonic Order was the undisputed power in Prussia and the dominant force in Livonia. And this hard-won success was however not mirrored in the lands the Order was initially set up to defend for Christendom, the Holy Land. Their main fortress, the Starkenburg, northeast of Haifa, had been besieged first in 1266 and then in 1271, when it fell to the Mamluks. After that debacle, the Grand Master relocated the order's headquarter from Acre to Venice. Acre fell in 1291. Acre fell in 1291, which ended the Crusader state in Palestine. The order continued in Venice for a little longer, but in 1309 when no new crusading efforts in Palestine seemed likely, the Grand Master relocated to Prussia, to the magnificent castle of Marienburg. Next time we'll talk about what is often described as the Golden Age of the Teutonic Knights, when they ran one of the most stringently organized polities in medieval Europe, excelled both as politicians and merchants, as well as as organizers of the greatest chivalric adventure holidays that attracted counts, princes and even a future king of England. I hope you will join us again. <laughs>